today we are going to go over a lot of information. And for those of you that know me, um, the reason I do this and the reason I even do social media or any of these things, it, it's not about me. And it, it's not about like, it, it's really about um, treating lipedema and really understanding it. I, I don't think a lot of people truly understand it. And um, I think, the, again, the more information we get out there. And so, and I'll talk about total lipedema care, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, kind of at the end. Um, and kind of go over what we're doing here and things like that, because it's really exciting. And um, if you know how much we care about lipidema and care about treating and care about taking care of our, taking care of people, um, you'll also understand sort of like the direction that we're trying to go in. Um, and the one last thing I'll say also is um, this is um, dynamic and fluid, meaning that um, we've gone to a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, and you know I try to spend, I try to get through everything. If there's something we don't talk about or something that's really important um, that you want us to touch upon in future, please let us know. Feedback is great. I, I'm, I'm one of those people. I do this for, for you and for everyone else. So feedback, criticism is okay. Um, I, do try, I do speak fast, so I will try not to do that today. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to do a whole thing from the beginning. Hopefully, I say lipedema from A to Z. We're going to go over every aspect of it everything we see, everything we know nowadays. And um, like I said, hopefully you enjoy it. So overall, what is lipedema? Lipedema is a connective tissue disease. Now, even though we use the word disease, just understand that that's more the technical term. It's not something it's a really, actually, it's probably a good thing. In a way, it's scary to say disease, but in a good thing, it's that we're finally getting it out there in the medical community and the government. So, you know, there's a lot more, a lot more um, interest in understanding with it nowadays. But understand that it is genetic. It's mainly female. Uh, I've seen a few male patients with it. Um, uh, some more in my Dubai office in the Middle East, but um, I have seen patients, I've seen males with lipedema. Um, when we say non-dominant, that means that if I have two daughters, so let's just say my wife had lipedema and I have two daughters, it doesn't mean both of them are going to have lipedema. Neither might or one might. So, and also it may not be daughters it, or it may not be like just your initial like offspring. It can be, sometimes people will tell us it happened their aunt or their grandmother or somebody, you know, it wasn't necessarily their mom. So anyway, it can, you know, people start thinking back. It is hormonal, that, that's the really important stuff. So when we say that, it tends to propagate at puberty, pregnancy, when people start taking birth control pills with hormones, and of course with menopause. And I still, you know, menopause is an interesting one, um, but we do see a lot of people that say it's gotten worse before then. Um, because it is a connective tissue disorder, and we'll talk about that stuff, People are extremely flexible. I always joke around and say, if you and I did yoga together, um, you'd be a lot better than I am at it. Of course, I'm probably the most inflexible person on the planet, no matter how much I stretch. But overall, I just want people to understand that. And there's good and there's, good, there's bad with that too. Most of the time, because of that, most people that have this were athletes, um, especially younger. Um, people say their teenage years and above, they were gymnasts and, and played played um, softball on people say it could catch her and stuff like that because you can bend down. And so it, it's really interesting, but also because of that, and because the joints are more lax, a lot of people have had early joint surgeries. Most people that I've seen, even, even if they're in their thirties uh, or forties, and most people have had knee scopes and shoulder scopes and things like that. So I, I my caution that I tell everybody is um, as you get older, just understand your body and understand you don't have to kill it to, to keep yourself healthy. Um, and then, of course, <clears throat> a lot of people speak about it as painful fat. I put fat in, I, I, I speak of fat that way because it's really not fat. And that's a lot what we're going to talk about today. So overall, being a connective tissue disease. So joints, ligaments, tendons, skin. Um, all of those are extremely stretchable and, flexi and flexible. Um, adipose, which is fat, is actually a considered a connective tissue also. So that's why I put that in here. But again, understand that your whole body is more lax and loose, including the skin, including, and again, we talked about the joints. So just be very careful as you're doing things. The prevalence, we don't really know. 
Um, but we do from the from the European literature, we estimate about 11% of the female population. Um, to understand, to put that in perspective, my history for a lot of you that don't know also long lipedema is breast cancer. Um, I've actually developed the um, US standard of care guidelines, not only for lipedema, but also for breast cancer. And breast cancer is about the same numbers. We say about one in nine women. And so what's interesting is if you're diagnosed with breast cancer, which is not a good thing I'm saying, but it, the whole world wants to take care of you. You can go to your centers, you go to your doctors, this and that. The lipedema, it's not that way. You get diagnosed, they want you to jump through a bunch of hoops, and we'll talk about that as we as we go through. But genetic, so family history reported. Again, we don't know exactly. Uh, there are there are genes coming out and things that can be um, and things that can be pinpointed a little bit, but I, I, I still think we're a little far away to get to that point where we can say this gene links to it, kind of like back to breast cancer. We have the BRCA genes, and so I don't think we're at that point. But the fact that it is genetic and we're looking into that and studying that is really important, I think, for the future. Again, cause. No one knows exactly why this happens, but we do know that the hormonal factors are really, really important. And it just seems that possibly estrogen, but things as, as the hormones um, start functioning in your body and grow, it seems like that just causes a trigger in the local local tissues and allows things to start growing. And we'll talk about the inflammation and everything. The stage of lipedema. I'm actually gonna gloss over the slide and it, it, for an important reason. And for those of you that know me really well, um, the stages were, uh, people have come up with this a, a long, long time ago and uh, they really focus on the skin. And they talk about it stage one is not so bad. Stage four is, is really bad. Um, but the reality is it, it's not a great staging system just to look at someone's skin and say how bad they actually are or how bad their lipedema is. So the reality is I don't believe in the stages at all. It's again, it's looking at the skin quality. If your skin's bad, you have bad lipidema, the skin's good quality, you, you don't have bad lipidema, which not, isn't true at all. I'll take care of patients that have legs like mine, stage one, and they have excruciating pain. I'll take care of people with stage three or four and the pain's not so bad, but mobility issues. And so it, it doesn't make sense at all. So I think if we're really gonna come out with a staging system, kind of like breast cancer, I would say if you're stage one breast cancer or stage four breast cancer, those are totally different animals, totally different treatments. We should be doing the same thing and looking at that. And Dr. Herbst and I are start, actually starting to spend a lot of time doing that, just so you guys know. But anyway, I think we need to really come up with a more comprehensive system. The other thing that's important too is that volume does not correlate with pain. In fact, next further lectures, I'm gonna start like uh, emphasizing that. Again, stage one doesn't mean you don't have pain and it doesn't mean that you're gonna get to, so it also doesn't mean if you're stage one, you're gonna move to stage four. It doesn't work, it, it doesn't work that way. And so we don't understand why some people move towards those directions, some people don't. But overall, just understand volume doesn't correlate with pain. When somebody comes in, their legs are huge and they're, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean it's worse. Harder, to tr maybe slightly harder to treat, but in terms of like, in terms of like what's going on in their bodies, I think everybody that has lipedema, I treat everybody the same and understand that I think this is a really bad thing and I want to take care of it. I, my other caveat is that, as you know, um, myself and at Total Epidemic Care, we're the largest proponents of insurance covering this in the country. And I'll say the world too, because I do actually try to have the government in the UAE cover my patients in Dubai and Middle East and stuff. Um, but my concern is that if we say someone stage one on the insurance, you know, on our um, on our diagnosis. I don't want insurance companies to say, well, wait till they get to stage four or something like that. Because again, you may never get there and it can still make your life miserable. So again, I don't believe in stages. So everybody that's ever done my webinars or knows me, whenever we have our consult, they understand that. When I, I know people when they haven't done that because they ask me, what stage am I in? <laughs> so again, I don't mind mentioning it, but it's just, uh, I think if, again, I'm really academic and I'm very scientific and I, I really want people to understand what we're thinking and why. And again, in the future, if you ever do talk to me or you have questions, everything that I do has a reason for it. So I'm not just making it up. Like, and I can tell you everything why and why I think that way. The same thing with the types. This one is even, uh, I think this one's even worse for me, to be honest with you. But 
somebody tried to put the types together, like if it's in the if it's in the pelvis or the knees, or if it goes down to the leg or to the arms. And so again, uh, that kind of doesn't make sense to me in a lot of ways. Um, but I think these staging systems and these types were good. I think it was good because we needed to kind of move, start moving forward and getting things out there. But again, if you know my types, uh, this is I kind of break things up and keep it pretty simple. And as you start noticing, you'll notice that I break it up into what I call classical and centralized. Again, this is my this is my classification. So just understand this isn't out there. It doesn't mean if somebody else doesn't say this, they're wrong at all. It's, it's just the way I look at things. But it's also really important for me because if you look at somebody that's centralized, you look at I, you look at their ankles and you say, wow, their ankles aren't that bad. Again, if we talk about lipedema being stovepipe and symmetrical and down to the ankles, then that means that person that has centralized somebody, you know, especially insurance companies or other doctors may not think they have lipedema and, that, and that's not fair. Um, there's positive and negatives to both of these types. Um, the centralized type, the positive is that because it doesn't affect the ankles as much, people are able to, you know, we'll say from a you know, personal perspective, they're able to wear dresses and skirts and shorts and things like that. And it's, you know, um, but because it's centralized and it's really located around the, the, the hips, the, the upper thighs, the abdomen, the buttock shelf, it's actually really hard for people to sleep. Uh, it's hard for them to sit down a lot. Like it's really fo lo localized there. Um, the classical kind, of course, as you can see, it's really, you know, of course, it's really, really bad. Um, it goes all the way down. There's a lot of cuffing. Cuffing is the hardest thing to treat with people because that's it gets to a point where it's just fibrotic and you can't always remove it. Um, with both of them, as they get worse though, the knee becomes the issue because the knees, when your skin drapes over the knee that much, it, there's no, we'll talk about you know fixing things later down the road. It, it's really hard to like fix that and also have you have bendable knees. The one, one other thing I'll say also is with my centralized, I do think there's a higher propensity to have it in the arms also. I just tend to see that not 100%, but I do think it really seems to be more the upper body with my centralized type. This is probably my most important slide today. So if you guys just want to look at this one and then if you go do other things, you're okay. No, I'm just kidding. But more importantly, this is my most important slide. This is a slide. This is a picture I pulled off the internet. It's not, it's not mine. You can Google it. If you Google anorexic lipedema, um, the most important thing to see is that she's emaciated above the waist and look at her legs. They haven't changed. Lipedema is not fat. When I'm talking to people and they're telling me about their diets and their exercise and their ketogenic and their, uh, uh, they're starving themselves and this and that, and they say that things haven't changed. It's because lipedema is not fat. And we'll talk about what it actually is. It's not metabolically active. People that have gastric bypass and all these things, it doesn't help the lipedema. Now, if there's a huge obesity component with it, sometimes gastric bypass to get us down to the lipedema part, you know, surgically and correctively may make things better. But overall, just understand it's not about diet and exercise. I'm not telling you not to not to eat healthy and do everything you're doing because one of the best things I love about my lipedema patients is that you all are the most active people out there. Uh, you guys exercise more, you eat better, you're so conscientious, and so it's of course for a lifetime. Um, but anyway, just understand there's a, just understand that you're, there's very limited things you can actually do to make this better. And my favorite thing to tell people is to throw your scale away. Everybody, all my consultations, everybody tells me they were 120 then, they're 170 now, or they were they're 310 now, but they got down to 280. Uh, the numbers don't matter on the scale. So the numbers don't matter. There's a lot more that goes into the body. It's a lot more complex. Inflammation increases more fluid and retention, and this and that. So there's a lot more. The numbers don't matter. And if you focus on a number on a scale, most people are going to starve themselves and probably not do, uh, may not do extremely well. So it may be harder for them to even heal. And we'll talk about BMI. BMI is another one that thing that I talk about a lot. Lipedema does not correlate with BMI. Most patients that come to see me, everyone, uh, I mean, 
everyone's obese. I'm obese. I mean, everybody, you know, there's no, these BMI is the dumbest number on the planet. You can actually quote me on that. It makes no sense. Somebody divided something and said, oh, this is BMI. Um, what I will say though, is that it does not, lipidemia does not correlate with BMI. So again, I have some patients that are BMI is a 50, 60, they're over 300 pounds, this and that, yet they're sometimes healthy, they're healthier than I am. It's not fat, it's not cardiovascular, it's not diabetes, and it's not bother, it's not those things. So we will, of course, look into those things, but typically it's not. The one thing that I will say, though, is that as you look at the patients, if you look at that, those previous pictures, like the centralized uh, versus the, the, you know, the, the classical, as you do get to those higher higher levels where there's a lot of volume and the skin's bad quality, you do have to understand that a higher BMI does have higher complications. The, the healing process is harder, um, higher chance. We'll talk about that during surgeries. Um, and the reason I say that is a lot of patients come to me and the first thing they say is, will you take care of me? And my answer, as long as they're healthy and stuff, or they can't, we can, my answer is always yes. Whereas they've gone to other doctors, especially people that don't understand or treat lipedema, and they'll say, well, you're, you have to get down to your, you have, you have to lose 20 pounds. You have to get down to a BMI of 29 or whatever it is, make, you know, coming up with a number. So I don't think that's important at all. But what I will say is risk versus benefit. And I look at this with every surgery and every treatment, everything that we do. And what that means is, so if somebody comes to me and their BMI is 50, and we know that they have a higher risk of a complication, let's say it's a, a tummy tuck and there's a higher chance of fluid buildup or something like that. The risk there of that happening, still, the benefit still outweighs that. Meaning by removing that tissue and get things may take a little longer to heal, but when we get to the point that you're healed, we've removed so much tissue, especially so much bad lipedema tissue that people do better. It allows you to get on with your life. So let's talk about what's actually going on internally. And again, I, for those of you that know me, my most important thing is understand why. Understand why with everything, and then you know what the answer is after. So, um, so we'll just talk about it. Essentially, what's going on is that since, as I said, skin, joints, ligaments, tendons, everything is stretchy, everything's more uh, flexible. Your, your vessels, and I, when I talk about them, uh, arteries, veins, lymphatics, those are also pretty flexible and or stretchy, or we'll say leaky is another word that, that people that people will use for that. Um, I don't focus on one or the other. And so that's a really important thing. But overall, we're going to talk about why this happens, things leaking out, and we're going to understand sort of what the, you know, sort of um, wh why we get to these points here. So blood vessels, the vessels, sorry, not blood vessels, vessels, arteries, veins, lymphatics, very leaky. So you can just type it, see, the whole circulatory system works that your heart pumps out. Um, yeah, I'll just give everybody an overview. Your heart pumps out, you know, oxygenated blood from the, from the lungs, brings it to the body. When it's the, your, your cells take up the oxygen, nutrients, things like that. The deoxygenated blood takes your veins, take it back to the lungs, and it kind of, the, everything repeats. Lymphatics are what we call a catch-all. So lymphatics are outside of that. And when fluid is extra, they will, the lymphatics will pick that fluid up and bring it back into the circulatory system. So that's how lymphatics work. Very, very simple way to explain it. But there's also a, uh, there's also lymph nodes and they sample things to see about infection and stuff like that. So there's a lot more, but I'm just kind of keeping it simple for, the, for this process today. So, if you look at what's going on between a lipedema vessel and a normal vessel. So when you look at, like uh, we talk about uh, the external compression and things like that. So normal vessel, things stay inside. Um, things that are small enough can you know, leak, come through when they need to be. When there's lipedema, if you look at it, again, things are more stretched out, more leaky, and things are normal proteins, things that are in our blood leak out into our tissues. There's different types of pressures that happen. Hydrostatic pressure pushes against it. So let's just say um, you're let's just say you're wearing tight compression because there's so much pressure outside of the vessel. By the way, this is really I, I have a I have a master's in physiology and biophysics. So I, I, I if I this is too in depth, but I, I like to explain it if it's 
I'm trying to keep it simple, but again, I want you to understand this. So um, hydrostatic pressure is when, let's say you're, there's a lot of pressure externally outside the blood vessel. So because of that, because the pressure is so great outside the blood vessel, that fluid is not, it will not tend to leak out into it because it's going to stay inside the vessel. Um, colloid osmotic pressure basically means that if you have a lot of, let's say, uh, charged particles like uh, proteins, nutrients, things like that, things that are, are large, and let's say they go outside of the blood vessel because they're, they will, fluid will actually get attracted to it. So more fluid gets pulled out. So if you think about lipedema, proteins, things that are in our blood leak out into our tissues. And then because that's a vicious cycle, then more fluid follows and it just kind of keeps going and going and going. So that's, that's overall what there is. Um, and again, just another way of looking at it, the normal proteins and things leak out into our vessels. And because of that, our body forms an inflammatory response. That's the pathophysiology of lipedema. It's the localized inflammation that creates everything. And we'll talk about the things that happen here. So as you start to get into edema development, so as when you start looking at the edema, which is the lip, the lip of the edema portion of lipedema. So there's two ways of looking at it. One is that the, your vessels, all your vessels, including your lymphatics are more leaky and there's a lot more fluid there. However, if you look at most people that have actually had lymphocentigraphies, lymphogram, like things where they've looked at the lymphatic system, most people have a pretty normal lymphatic system. I've only seen a few people that have actually had anything really, really abnormal. Um, over time, you can see some structures in it. But what we're trying to figure out, though, is that, that the lymphatics are necessarily bad or is that it's everything, everything is so overloaded that it's actually decreasing the, the amount that the lymphatics can bring back to the heart and the, with the outside pressure, is it compressing the vessels more? So it's harder for things to work and return. And so I think it's, uh, I think there's a little bit of both in there, but just understand it's not one simple thing. When you look at edema overall, again, I'm going to get into a little bit, a uh, little bit of a, uh, um, it will get a little in depth here for a second. Um, but again, when you see this, you see cap capillaries are the parts that when you have like um, arteries connect to the veins and they things get smaller, they go from arter arteries to arterioles and then to capillaries. Capillaries are one cell thick and those are where nutrients and oxygen, everything get exchanged. And so what we see is a lot of capillary fragility, meaning your capillaries aren't working extremely well. Um, you'll get a mechanical, again, because of that, is there too much fluid? Will we get a mechanical obstruction of the lymphatic vessels? Meaning, is there just too much fluid that they can't do it? And there's so much pressure and they're, they're, you know, they're small and thin also. So are they getting compressed down? Um, reduced skin and connective tissue elasticity. So what happens is because of the scarring and fibrosis and everything going on internally, all the scar, I, I, if you ever heard my, my term, which is not the most scientific or medical, but I say it's sometimes a scar ball inside. And because of that, when there's a lot of scar around or fibrosis, things are not going to function properly. Um, there's also reduced mobility when you, every time we walk and pump our muscles and pump everything, things go back. But overall, what you see here is a decrease effectiveness of the venous and lymphatic system. So most people say that they have venous disease. Most people say they have lymphatic disease, but overall it's still for me because of what's going on from the lipedema and because of the inflammation. This is a very crazy picture, <laughs> which I kind of like to have out there actually. Um, but just to understand, the reason I show this is not to get into every little aspect of everything on here. It's so that people understand, again, it's not diet. It's not the simple thing. It's not key. There's a lot more stuff that goes on. In fact, I'll, I'll summarize this in a, a, as simply a, as possible. But what happens is once the fluid, once the proteins and things leak out into our tissues, our body forms an inflammatory response to that. Because of the inflammation, you can't get enough oxygen, can't get enough nutrients to localize cells, let's say in the lower legs. 
Your body says, hey, I need more oxygen. I need more nutrients. So it starts sending out growth factors, growth factors to grow more capillaries and, and bring more, bring more, you know, hopefully uh, nutrients and oxygen to the area. What happens though is as those grow, it does create more blood vessels and you get these, right? I say rudimentary capillaries. That's why, because it's growing so fast, but it's trying to work, that's why you bruise very easily. So if you ever, people say they, they don't realize where this bruise came from or, or sort of what happened. And so it's really, your body's just trying to grow. That's what the hypoxia thing is. So also some cells will die. So what happens is some of the fat tissue, some of the localized tissues will die. You get these things called macrophages. They're the ones that come in and eat debris. They, they kind of, they're like the garbage removal for your, for your body. Um, they'll wind up breaking things down. Then what happens is your body says, okay, I need more. And then it starts growing again by putting out more growth factors and it starts breaking down and dying and going back and forth. And I think that's where you see actually the development of the nodules. But again, nowhere in here did I mention uh, starvation, calories, diet. This is something that keeps growing and going without your control. And that, that's one of the hardest things for people to understand that you can't control what's actually going on inside your body. This is one of, this is a, a very good slide. I, I like putting this out there. Um, for those of you that don't know, my, my wife just started nursing school. Uh, she was a school teacher. And a few years ago, she had to do her prerequisite classes and stuff. And so she, um, she wrote her, her pathophysiology paper on lipidema. It's become like a family tradition, I guess. Um, but she found this, found this picture and I, I think it's amazing. So if you look at the normal fat, like if you look at what, like, let's say you take the thing that says normal fat, let's say that's, that's my tissues. Um, everything looks uniform. Everything looks pretty normal or, or, you know, yeah, uniform is probably the best word. And the way fat works, the way fat, I eat a lot of cheeseburgers tonight, which my wife hates. My body stores that. It takes it in as triglyceride and stores it in the fat cells. So the fat cells grow They'll get larger together as I lose weight and pretend I'm going to start working out the next day, then they start shrinking down. And so that as your body releases triglyceride to use that to burn things. If you look at the lipedema biopsy, this is one of the only times where you'll ever see completely different things. You'll see what's called adipocyte hypertrophy and hyperplasia. What's that? What hypertrophy means is larger cells. So they will actually grow in those areas. But the hyperplasia is actually the most important term. Hyperplasia means you're getting more cells. So there's more cells per square, you know, per, per square like um, area here than there are in the normal. So your body's actually making more fat cells as well. Again, that's because all the localized tissues are all growing. It's not only the fat, it's growing the you know, connective tissue, it's growing the blood vessels, it's growing everything, but this does happen also. But again, this is not something you can control. This is happening because of all the inflammation and everything that's going on inside. I'm actually going to let this play. I hope this works. So it started, they started um, to get very heavy going up hills. I'm a big hiker. I'm an avid um, outdoors enthusiast. And they started to get very heavy. I started to be very fatigued a lot easier. I have severe pain in the back of my thighs that um, hurt to the point of I keep rubbing them and then they cause a lot of bruising. Uh, my calves are the same type of way. They're starting to get heavy and they itch and they hurt. Um, and I'm hoping that just all goes away. So this is one of my, uh, again, I, I like, I like putting this out there again. You like hearing from patients also. And just so you know, in the future, if you ever want, we have hundreds of people, hundreds of patients you can talk to um, about their symptoms, what they've been through, how they feel after things. And so you ever, ever want to be connected with anybody. And we're at a point right now that we take care of so many people from different States as well as out of the country that I'm starting to put people together geographically, <laughs> which is kind of fun also. Um, but what you'll see, the symptomatology, what you'll see localized, which everybody kind of knows this part already, there's pain, 
uh, swelling. People say their legs feel heavy, like they're walking on tree trunks or concrete. Um, bruising, as we talked about, capillaries and everything is very fragile. People have bruises without even knowing that they are thinking that or without even touching anything. Um, legs are really cold. There's hypothermia. Again, they're not getting a lot of the warm blood and everything down to those areas. And a lot of people also say they have restless legs. They say they'll wake up in the middle of the night, Charlie horse, people describe it in different things. But I think the more important thing to understand is the systemic, which a lot of people don't know and don't, and don't understand. And that is, I call it like flu-like symptoms. So my history along with breast cancer is treating a lot of diabetic, diabetic foot infections, things like that. So when someone has a diabetic foot infection, let's say it's on their toe, they'll come into the emergency room, come to the office, and they'll basically say, I just feel bad. I mean, they don't even, they may not even know they have an infection. They just don't feel well. You know, they say they feel crampy, achy, maybe uh, fevers, chills, things like that, but they never realize if you, if somebody has that and you clean, you actually debride or clean out their foot infection within 12, let's we'll say 12 to 24 hours, but if 12, the next day, they're almost back to normal. It, it's really interesting to see how the body works. So what people have to understand is that it's not only the pain, the heaviness, the bruising, all that stuff, is that systemically you're feeling like you have a flu. There's the brain fog, there's memory loss, there's fatigue that's out of proportion to someone else. I always tell people, um, most people start self-diagnosing in their early 30s because that's when normal fatigue sets in. So if you're 35 and your best friend is 35 and they don't have lipidema, you do. Even if you eat better, um, even if you eat better, if you... Uh, exercise more, do all the right things, of course, um, you're more apt to be more tired. It's harder for you to walk distances. And so people don't realize like, what's actually going on. But understand, the systemic symptoms are real. Everybody, hopefully everybody on this knows this by now. And that is that we published well, last year now, since we're in a new year, happy new year, everyone. Um, the first U.S. standard of care guidelines for lipedema. And this is really, really important. This is a big breakthrough. It took us years to kind of put together. The government was involved because this is finally what puts things out there that says this is real. Um, insurance companies, other doctors, providers, other people cannot say it doesn't exist anymore. This is published now. This is it's there. So it's very, very important. Again, it's still grassroots. You know, people learn on these chat rooms and things like that. You know, that's how they talk to each other and help each other out. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But overall, we need to we need to start tackling lipedema as every other disease and illness in the world, especially the U.S. And that is, it needs to become more standardized, more um, research oriented. And so, this was a really, really big step. In fact, um, just this past week, I take care of a lot of patients from Canada also, and there's a nurse in Canada that I'm taking care of, and she was telling me that she's fighting with um, her local government, and one of the things that's really been beneficial for people, especially out, especially Canada, probably Mexico as well too, that is because the U.S. has a standard of care guidelines, Canada will follow it or at least acknowledge it. When it was only in, when the guidelines were only in Europe or other, you know, outside of the, the North America, it was a lot harder for them to say that it was a lot harder for them to, to agree with or, of course, acknowledge. So this is really a big breakthrough. I'm going to talk about kind of the conservative treatment options and things like that, but of course, getting towards surgery. Um, conservative treatment options, compression. Compression is the mainstay of the standard. Um, and the reason is I, I've had people tell me they tried compression, they failed it. Well, it, it doesn't, you have to understand why you're wearing it, not what it's, you know, can, this isn't lymphedema. It's not going to make your legs smaller. What the hope is, the reason like athletes wear compression is because there's a lot of inflammation and compression, massaging, things like that will decrease the inflammatory process. So when you, when I tell people when they first, when I tell them to first put compression on, especially, you know, the sort of things that should work and are tighter and this and that, I tell them they're going to hate me. So the first, the first few weeks they wear it, especially, you know, that knee area, medial knee and those areas that normally hurt, they're going to hurt more. But what happens over time is that the inflammation goes down and those areas start to soften up. 
And most people will say that they can't sleep without compression after weeks down the road, which is great. Um, I also say, tell people it makes surgery easier for both of us. When there's less inflammation and things are just soft or more mobile, I can get more out for you. And if there's less inflammation for you, you're less likely to have you know, pain after things like that. So it, it really works for both of us. Because compression is so hard, compression is the bane of our existence, especially with lipedema. So if somebody's classical or they're, or they're especially the, um, my centralized, like it's really hard to find stuff that works. So what I tell people, especially at first is something is better than nothing. If we're going towards like a surgery, like surgery, I just tell people find something that you can tolerate 24 seven. Um, of course you do want it to work, but it, it, it's hard. As we get through the surgical process and start removing tissues, your legs will become, I tell people half, sometimes a third the size they are now, stomach too. And then we'll, you'll go to, you'll get things that can be more custom made or whatever, things that fit you a lot better. Um, one exciting thing, which I'll kind of do a little teaser right now is that we've been uh, working on um, a compression garment here uh, for a while now that I think may work for most people. And um, I think it's gonna be really cool. So I'll leave it at that, but just know there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than people realize, and we're trying. MLD. So when it comes to MLD, MLD was obviously where people were really focusing on lymphedema and things like that. A lot of people have found that they, that lymph, uh, sorry, MLD works for them. Other people, and, and same thing with like the squeezer and stuff like that. Um, what I tell people, I have some patients that come in and say they love that okay, they do it, they feel like the fluid, they feel like they're peeing for the next two or three days, and the pain's gone down and stuff like that, and they, they feel great. Other people may not. And again, I think it's as we in the future, as we understand that there really are differences with the types of lipidema. When I say types, I mean the internal stuff. Some people are more fibrotic, some people are nodular. I think as we get to that point. My thing that I tell everybody with all the conservative treatments is again, something's better than nothing. Just understand it's not going to remove things. It's not going to, it's not going to cure. It's not going to cure what's going on there, but it can help people to stop the progression of things. And it, as I said, some people feel better. So uh, I think if this works for you, please continue to keep doing it. Um, after surgery, some people still love doing it. It's just, it's different for different people. I don't have an opinion one way or the other. I always tell people what works best for you, you know your body better than anybody else, continue to do that then. So now we're gonna talk about uh, the surgery aspect of it. So uh, this is one of our things where we're, you're watching us take out all those uh, terrible little lipedema guys and boom there they go so um it, it, it's uh, i'll say it's a lot of fun but it's also it's amazing to see what we see with this so i'm going to talk about how the surgery works and again most important is why we do stuff so when you look at the when you look at the body um sorry <laughs> sorry let me do that so when you look at the body and you look at sort of a, it's not as simple as skin, fat, and muscle. Your body's actually broken up into a lot of different, it, it's, it's not, yeah, there's a lot more that goes on inside. This is a very simple slide to even show that. But what I show people here is the top portion, number one is your skin, number five is your deep fascia, and the, below there's the muscle. The superficial fascia, which is the blue line there, that's really, that's really important. That is throughout our entire body in in stomach, I use that to do what's called our internal waist trainer because I, I leave that behind. Um, in the face, you can use it as your smash to do facelifts and things like that. So I think it's really important. But the most important thing to understand is that we do we don't want to make things worse when it comes to our surgical procedures. The goal is to make things better. Um, Surgery is going to cause an amount of scarring and inflammation and things like that. So you want to be careful with everything. So when you see the, the best lymphatics, and most of them are actually at the superficial fascia or even below there. So those are the areas that we really, you'll, you'll see as I go forward, but those are the areas I don't liposuction in. That's where I do a lot of the manual extraction, but we're going to get to that. But this is a, just to show everybody that there is a method to everything that we do. The first step of what I do is I actually, I put fluid in. Now, 
I, we use a Tumescent, a Tumescent solution. We can talk about that. And so we all, every surgeon probably has a different one. I, I use the one that I like and I, I feel like really works, studied over years. Um, but more importantly, it's sort of how we do it. So I like, since the nerves and the big blood vessels and everything are, are deep, especially against the deeper fascia, I try to infiltrate deep. I put the fluid in deep and let everything kind of expand out. Um, we're doing that to a point that I try to put it, uh, I put enough in uh, so that I get what's called exsanguination or at least like this turgor, which is tightness so that I can decrease the, the blood that's in there and blood flow and stuff like that. I hate seeing blood during surgery and rarely do. So there's a lot more that there's a lot that goes into this. As we talk about the lymphatic sparing liposuction portion, this is really, really, really important. Again, this is only part of our, part of our procedure. And so I do the lymphatic sparing liposuction portion above the superficial fascia or stay superficial. I try to do it parallel to the skin, um, not going deep with this. Again, I don't want to liposuction or suction deep where there's lymphatics and things like that. Like I'd like to stay away from there as much as possible. The other important thing is actually something that I've learned over time. And if you see my last thing there, it says the fascia is very weak. Understand that fascia is a thick connective tissue. It, it, it's throughout our entire body. There's the, the deep one is really thick. The superficial one's a little thinner, more flimsy. But people with lipedema, because you have a connective tissue disorder, even your fascia is going to be weaker. You see this when people come in and they'll say like their calves are really large, but we didn't get a lot of tissue. We didn't get a lot of lipedema out. When the, fat, when the deep fascia is really weak, your muscles and everything aren't held together in there as much. And that will expand out. I, I, I have a lady where she thought she had a huge thigh mass and it turned out it was just all her adductor muscles. The things that are there in your medial thigh were just hanging. And so another reason why I think people also have problems with walking and the pain and stuff like that. But there's another interesting thing. And that is I have a few patients that, um, have had surgery with doctors that wanted to try treating lipedema and after their procedures, especially in the lower extremities, um, they're having problems walking. Now I have one in particular that's in her thirties and she's using a walker. Um, it's very, very easy to penetrate the fascia and get into the muscle. Same thing like in the abdomen is you can penetrate it into your organs. So this is, people really, really have to understand this is not liposuction. This isn't simple. And I have, as I said, we have MRIs to show the patients and it's just, it, it's, it, it's really scary actually. So I just tell people it's really not that simple and just understand just going to get liposuction is not always the right thing to do. This is what I like to show people. This is a, I know that that incision looks huge, but it's probably smaller than your pinky head. It's probably just a few millimeters, but we blew this up on purpose. This was a, um, a small hole that I used to, to do A, the lymphatic sparing liposuction, uh, and B, also do the manual technique. But the reason I show this picture is if you look at that little purple vessel there, that's a very small, tiny vein, um, millimeters. And it's completely intact. This is after I finished the procedure and it was there. So to show people that, again, liposuction needs to be done gently. It needs to be done. It, it, it's not an attacking thing. It's, 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 it's very, it should be, it shouldn't be that way at all. It should be the opposite. Um, but more importantly, it shows that what we do is very, very gentle. Now, this is, this is where we're getting to the, the meat of it or the crux of it, and that is the nodules. Um, I'll tell people about how we started figuring the nodules out, but I'll keep it really simple and say that I can never finish a surgery procedure and feel like I haven't done everything I could possibly do. Years ago, I was just doing lymphatic sparing liposuction and finishing, and I could feel what I call the pebble garden, and I could not leave that behind. And so it's taken us a long time and, and this and that, but now we have the nodules and manual, we'll talk about that down to a science. But anyway, the nodules, even though they look like fat, they're like homas, again, they're thick connective tissue. You see me squeeze them, you see me pull them out there. That's not, it's not fat. At, at this point, it's life, it's not fat at all. And when you see sort of how thick and hard they are, if you think you can get that out with liposuction, but anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that down the road. Um, 
But the reason it's really, really important here is that if you look at this is a, if you look at that leg on the right side there, that's someone actually you can probably see the little blood vessel in there too. <laughs> so um, that's someone that I've completed the lymphatic sparing liposuction on. In fact, that might be the same patient from before. But look at this. At the end of the procedure, I'm squeezing your skin and look, all that is nodules in there. It's still attached. Everything is still in there. So this is when we, we this is when we go in and we take out the nodules. We do our what we call our manual lipedema extraction. The nodules. Nodules, I mean, these are some, I mean, these are, these are actually more recent pictures. Um, this is, that nodule is someone I, I took out of somebody's arm. Uh, it's the largest one I've seen on an arm before, um, but it's the size of your hand. And so just to show that it's, they can be bigger and smaller and they come in different shapes and sizes. But my whole thing is you got to, got to get these out. To show the, uh, to show the video there, we're squeezing that. It's not moving. <laughs> so the reason I show that is to understand that this is not fat. It's not, in fact, fat, take a step back. Fat's used nowadays, or not nowadays. I've been using fat for breast reconstruction for forever. I used to do what's called a composite reconstruction, where after somebody had a mastectomy, I would, we do an expander, then we put an implant in, and then down the road, we would fat graft, fat graft the skin so that um, you, it would be like a saw, it would be like a more natural, You're, you'd have some fat there, you'd have some, the implant will be deep. And so really, really, but that when you see fat that you're using for um, reconstruction or for aesthetic reasons, things like that, like it's this healthy, like it's just, it's just healthy looking. This is not, this is not something that's healthy at all. Just some more pictures of it as we go, but the reason I show this picture, especially with the canister on the left side, so that's a typical, let's say, day that, that we have here. Um, if you look at how it almost looks like, a, I don't know, a, a, a flurry or this, you know, it's all, it's white and broken up and this and that, that's not normal fat. That's thick connective tissue, that's lipedema that we're able to get out with the lymphatic sparing liposuction. But again, you see very, very little fluid and stuff at the bottom, but that's tissue that's not normal. If you see the ouch thing, which is kind of fun, but you can see that these nodules are large. That's the stuff we have to get out then with the manual technique. So how does this work? Um, I, I like history and I love anatomy and I like understanding it, but just to keep things really, really simple, um, long, long time ago, people did not know how to figure out how to treat lymphedema. This is, you know, a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, so what... Char uh, Charles procedure. So what Sir Charles started doing for people is it literally he would actually, let's say it was the it was the lower leg on that that right side there. Um, he would actually take out take off the skin, cut out all the tissue underneath, all the subcutaneous lymphedema tissue, and then he'd skin graft the back of the leg. Looks crazy, however, it does work. <laughs> so the reason I say that is. That's kind of what we're trying to do when we look at the lymphatic sparing liposuction and plus the manual lipidema extraction technique. My goal that I tell everybody, and I, I usually make a, a C with my hand and my index finger is the top, my uh, thumb is at the bottom, and I say the index finger is the skin, the thumb is the muscle. My goal is to take out as much or everything that I can in between those areas. Um, when we do that, that's when A, people feel better. B, I don't, I mean, you can get recurrence. We can talk about that, but um, I feel like we're thoroughly treating this procedure and that's the most important for me. Um, if you look at that picture, uh, look at that uh, cartoon there with Scarpa's fashion, stuff like that. It's actually a picture from a, um, from a, a abdominoplasty or tummy tuck thing that I use because there's a lot of reasons where I, even, even without lipedema, the way I do tummy tucks and things like that is you want to leave as many lymphatics behind. I now keep the scarpest fascia behind. So again, you understand anatomy, you understand what's going on in there as a surgeon, um, you can treat people a lot better. So the nodules is what everybody always asks. Nodules, they can intertwine with the skin, connective tissue, they can be deep, they can be super, they're, they're kind of everywhere, but they can be very large as you've seen sort of the, uh, the things that we've pulled out of people already. So I want to show um, everybody, this is a large lipedema nodule we got out of somebody. 
And when I tell people liposuction doesn't get out the nodules, this hole right here is the liposuction cannula. Went right through, but didn't get out the lipedema. That's why you have to do the manual technique. We use the liposuction just to kind of soften things up, but really it's so that we can get out these nodules and that's what we wind up doing. But that's interesting, I haven't really seen too much of that where actually it goes, it's so hard and firm, it goes completely through, but doesn't disrupt the rest of it. So again, that, that's a video actually from the past six months um, when I pulled out some really large nodules and I found that and I, I thought it was really interesting to show when people say you don't have to be manual. And again, I'm, I, just so you know, I the way I do things is I think it's the right I think it's the right way to do it. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm right and someone else is wrong or vice versa. It just means that I. I feel like this is the best way to do it. I have hundreds of patients that have gone through this, have had this done and are doing so well. And so that's how I look at my whole career. And I say, if something's not going right, is there a way to change it and do that? So, but when I saw that, that was, I mean, every, we, I want to say we're still learning more and more and more, but when I saw that, that was like, a, that, that was a real, game, another one of those game changer things for me where I know we're on the right track with what we're doing. So... Um, when you look at manual lithium extraction, so I've heard people say, uh, you know, there's these chat rooms and some people say, oh, don't, don't do it. It's, it looks terrible. It's actually a deep massage. <laughs> it's, it, it's actually, if you think about it, the reason I love doing this is liposuction and cannulas and suction cause a lot more scarring and fibrosis and issues. Um, I, I, I don't, and I'll talk about, it. I don't use any um, energy-based devices like Vaser, body type, things like that. I think those are, I won't, I don't even use those, uh, especially Vaser. I wouldn't use that cosmetically, but uh, anything that can create more scarring, more inflammation, I, I just tend not to use. Again, I'm not saying I'm right. Someone else is wrong, but that, that's kind of what we're doing. We're really doing sort of a soft, um, uh, a, a massage technique. And so we've, we've um, over time have, uh, I got it down to a science now. It's taken a long time to get there since uh, we, we we started this. We haven't, you know, there's no literature. There's no one else that's ever done it before. So, but it really it really works and it's really great. Um, but this is a this is a, uh, a case report that I, I like to talk about. So um, I did have I had a lady that um, I, I love taking care of. She was ex extremely nice and. Um, she also had a I mean, really, really severe lipedema uh, and also a lot of a lot of medical issues on top of that. And so um, we wound up, we were taking care of her. We really staged things out a lot. But what became interesting, though, as I, she's had a history of, of DBT, which is blood clots. And so she was on blood thinners. So when I was taking care of her arms, um, the right arm, I was able to do my full treatment lymphatic sparing liposuction and the MLE did everything. The left side, I did the lymphatic sparing liposuction and saw bleeding and I stopped there. Again, I don't like seeing bleeding during surgery and I knew we were coming back. I'll always finish everything. But what was interesting when I saw her at a three op, uh, sorry, a three week post-op visit, it was like night and day. The arm that we had treated completely, it was like, it was like a brand new arm. I, you could squeeze it, you should get lift it up in the air, move it, it was great. The left arm, which only had lymphatic sparing liposuction, almost like we didn't treat it. It was still tender, she couldn't hold up, couldn't hold it up as much. It was just, a, uh, anecdotally, it was just amazing to see. So again, you, we, can we, as we're going through and doing this, we're seeing that things work, but it, it's nice to see that it does help people. So the lipedema surgical treatment, um, these are things that a lot of patients ask me. And so I just kind of try to answer them and go over it now, especially. So um, I can never tell before surgery the difference or how much lymphatic spring liposuction versus manual varies per patient. Just know that I do both on every patient. In fact, I've only had a few patients like this, but um, when those nodules were that large, like you saw earlier, the size of our fist. I'm at, I've actually started with the manual portion and then finished up with it. So, you know, sometimes I got to go back and forth and do more. So overall, just know I'm, I'm, we stay in until we finish and do everything that we possibly can, but I always do both. Um, people talk about, I think people talk about fibrosis and they say, oh, I'm going to go to someone and they're going to break up and remove the fibrosis and this and that. So understand that 
Fibrosis is scar. It's really thick, hard scar. If you think about my breast cancer patients, when someone had a breast cancer on one unilateral, one side versus the other, you know, we would do bilateral mastectomies, take out everything. But the side that didn't have that, sorry, the side that had the cancer would get radiated, you'd get radiation. Radiation creates a lot of scarring and fibrosis. And if you've ever seen what that looks like, what a breast reconstruction looks like when it's scarred and fibrotic, it's not going to, it won't expand as well. It's not going to be as good, but of course you're treating cancer. So that's a, you know, it's a good thing for people, but understand that you, you can't remove this. And if you go in and cut out scar or cut out fibrosis, you're just creating more fibrosis. So again, I, I just, you know, I'll just say for me, I spend a lot of time trying to get everything out. Like I said, the, the certain areas such as the, the ankle cuffing or the cuffing, that's really a challenge. Sometimes I spend a lot of time trying it, but I, I can only do so much. And I also will never do anything that I think is going to make something worse. So at some point you have to say, we are where we are. The only thing we can all do to help each other out is to start obviously doing these lectures, talking to our friends, talking to our family, talking to our doctors. The earlier we can treat people, the better it's going to be for everyone. The less chance of it being long-term fibrosis and scarring and inflammation. So the other thing I tell people is the first surgery is the hardest. So uh, it's, it's a, I've, every patient I've ever on, everybody I talk to, I always say this because the reality is I don't really know what's going on inside your body. And you also don't know uh, sort of what's normal and what's not. So once I, after our first procedure, I can tell people, and I'm very specific and thorough. And I, I show people what we got out. I tell them what we, I tell them what I saw because we're all on the same team, but you know, sometimes it surprises me. Sometimes you don't think you're going to get a lot out. It's hard, and it all comes out. I call some people givers, meaning it's just the nozzles just keep pouring out. Um, other people, I can, I can do this manual thing. I can't get anything out. It's just, it's just different for different people. Same thing with the, the amount and volumes. Some people, you know, there, there's, uh, they have inches of lipidema tissue between their muscle and the skin. Other people, internally, the muscle is so expanded out and the fascia is so expanded out. There's actually not much tissue between the muscle and the skin. Almost like the way I explained is think about if you ever seen a guy at a beach with a, a beer belly, we'll say they're really hanging out. If you press on their stomach, even though you know there's fat, it's internal fat where the intestines are. So if you press on their stomach, it's really hard. You can't liposuction that. So it, it's a little different. Um, the other thing also is we don't, I, I can tell you that you know, how most people recover. And we've got hundreds of surgeries, we've got thousands now. And so we can, we can tell you about how people do, but the honest answer is I can't tell you exactly how you're going to do. Um, and so I let people talk to all our patients and go that, but it's different for different people. Most people feel better even the next day. Um, and then some people say, you know what, surgery was easy and then it was great. And we can, you know, next time we might do a little more. If it takes your body a longer time to recover, maybe we may spread things out a little bit more. So it's just different, but understand that we're still, you're still getting the best treatment in the world for this. So let's talk about the journey of surgery. People do want to know this. So, um, so we always want to do a physical examination person. I, I'm very, uh, if, for those of you that have had a consult with me or surgery with me, know that I'm very specific and very thorough. So we really, really go over every little aspect of it. So just understand we see each other multiple times. People are flying in from, from out of the country or out of the state, minimum the day before surgery. Uh, it could be, but you can come as often as you want, but financially, I think it's easier for people to, you know, come a day or two before and then come months before and then fly back and forth, but you're more than welcome to. But the reason I do that is we see each other in person. When I talk to someone on the phone, I say, you know what, let's start with the front and start with the back. The reality is until I actually get, get you here and we examine and I get a, a feel for uh, the nodules, how tender it is, you and I go over everything together. Um, that's when we kind of confirm everything. And I do that at least one day, at least one time. And then we do it the day of surgery also. So minimum two times, but it's just so we're all on the same page with everything. Um, understand also the surgical plan. It's truly, truly specialized for every patient. Um, the only common factor that I can tell people that I've seen is that um, I typically start with the worst areas. I, I really do. Um, for a lot of people, I do start commonly with the back of the body, and there's reasons for that. 
Um, but more importantly, where we start or what we get to, I'll tell you my, my two major things. Number one is I don't go circumferentially, meaning I don't go completely around the leg, especially the lower leg in one surgery. The reason is our surgery that we're doing is more thorough than anything that's out there. My concern, just like when you do a mastectomy, is that you're decreasing the blood supply. So if I take, if I do that, take out all the blood supply from especially the lower leg where it's cold, not great blood supply, my concern is the skin healing, dying, things like that. So I don't think that's the right thing to do. From another standpoint, and that is that from our from the guidelines, we do think that people with lipedema are at higher risk for getting blood clots. The reason is your vessels are more leaky. Um, it's just the, the muscles don't function as well. There's a lot of reasons. So my concern is that if I go completely around the leg in one procedure, um, that you're at higher risk on top of that for getting blood clots. So um, I would say one out of every three or 400 patients, someone will come in there. Uh, I would do circumferentially. It's real, but it's, it's real. And it's someone that literally they're 18 years old. We're figuring out they don't have a lot of tissue. We, you know, I want to take care of them. So, but it, it's really, really, really rare. The other thing that I've learned over time also is again, we talked about that earlier that, you know, higher BMI, but more importantly, the skin quality, the internal healing, the nutrition, everything is, is really a challenge with healing. So what I've learned over time is that, especially armless and thylus, I like to stage them. And what that means is I'll go in during the surgery and take out everything as much as again, as much as we can and let the skin shrink up. Don't cut the skin out at the same time. Let it shrink up, especially as people that have really, really, I mean, this skin, it's, it's hanging all over. What's interesting then is a few things. One is your chance of healing or having less healing issues or less problems is a lot, it's a lot greater. I think that the healing aspect is much better. But also, there are some people that surprise you. I've taken care of patients in their 60s that have their legs like look like they're loose, and then we take everything out, and because there's no more inflammation, everything, the skin shrinks up and they don't need an arm lift or thigh lift. And that makes me happy too. So I think it's kind of like it's kind of like a a team decision then to get to that point. But more importantly, you want to have control over your own body. I think it's smarter to stage these things. And that, that's exactly how and why I do it. Um, Post-op. So we'll, we'll talk about all these things, but um, we're getting down to a, a, there's actually some more slides that I need to start putting in here too, but things that I've learned over time, some I've learned from, from you all, that pay, the patients have taught me stuff, hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric oxygen, um, I've written wound care supplements and chapters, diabetes, things like that. And so I, I can get into how hyperbaric works, but just understand that if you have microvascular disease, meaning you can't get enough um, blood cells to a certain area, hyperbaric or high pressure oxygen allows more oxygen to get to those areas. So I think along with diabetes and wound care, I think this is really, really important. My patients that have done this seem to heal better, heal faster, quicker. I and mean, it's really kind of cool to see actually, but like swelling, bruising, everything just goes away a lot, a lot faster. I'm now having people, again, I, this is people start doing it on their own because, and this is all you all talking to each other. This is the chat over there. Thing. I'm now, people are now doing it before surgery. I have patients that are coming in when they see me, um, let's say they're flying in, they'll schedule a hyperbaric treatment. Then they'll come see me. Then the next day they do surgery. Then they say, do more, I do a few more after that. I mean, it's really great. <laughs> it's, and I have, I have people in their seventies that have some of the worst lipedema that they've healed and done well. And, uh, I, you can talk to them as well too, but, um, I'm really big into nutrition. Everybody knows that people with lipedema, you all can starve yourselves forever and it doesn't matter. Like you won't even be hungry, but nutrition, 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 you're not going to gain any weight at all that you need to eat. Um, IV fluids really important. We'll talk about sort of how we, we do that during surgery, but overall, we have a whole system in place, the whole surgery side of it, and even walking. So the next phase of things that I will tell you, my um, my chief of anesthesia, just so you know, um, we have a the surgery center. Everything that we do is confined in our office because of I'm a control freak, and I like control of every little thing, of every little aspect, of every little thing that we do. If you ask me why we do anything, I can tell you exactly why. So. 
I even have a chief of anesthesia. She's actually going to start writing some more stuff now and getting out there for our social media and everything, because not only is she a PhD, she's also runs the training program at USC, University of Southern California. She's also president of National Society. Like she's, we are coming up with a system like that. Even hospitals are going through this called ear acid. We've even taken that to the next level. Um, the way we do our anesthesia, I, I, it's just, we study every little thing and look at it. And it, it makes me happy. Just so all you know, I've operated on my own wife in my operating room here and the same anesthesia my wife got, everybody else gets. I've done that my whole career. It's just, I, I, I don't separate things out. I, we're, we're striving for the best overall process. The surgery is the best before surgery, during, after everything, every little process we're looking at. So we'll talk about the patient reported outcomes. Most people will say that they have, I mean, the symptoms are gone. They say they have less pain, less, um, less everything. They have a lot more energy. The energy thing is really cool when you see that with people. Um, a lot of people also say less swelling, they can sleep better. They don't need, they've been with or without compression, um, increased mobility. I have cool videos of people that, uh, um, they couldn't like, it sounds weird. They couldn't take their foot and kick their butt <laughs> behind, you know, just be like working out or anything. Now they can do that. Legs feel lighter. People say that they actually will overstep getting into their apartments or their cars. Like they don't, it's just, it's just a really, really great thing to see. And arms too. A lot of people I take care of, of course, professionals. You can, if you're a hairstylist or nurse or, you know, it's hard to do your arms, but some people even say, it's just hard to hold your arms up. Like even doing your hair, you got to take breaks. And now people, they'll say they couldn't hold their arms up for five or 10 seconds. Now it's like they're holding it for minutes. And it's really, and even, even days after surgery, it's really cool. The number one thing that we've heard from people that honestly, this isn't for me, this is, and this is from all of us here, which your outcomes and your happiness makes us happy. And so many people, I'm not saying one or two, I'm saying most people who've ever operated on will actually say that they've gotten their life back. They'll say it in different ways. They've run there. They've run um, 10 Ks. They can play with their grandkids. They can be with their, there's just a lot of things you hear, but overall it's just, it's really, really nice for us to hear. Um, anyway, I'll go over some common questions that we, you know, that a lot of people ask for and stuff like that. Um, a lot of this I've gone through so and I there's a lot more I want to get to with you guys but overall we use Tiva we talked about that it's really really um we're gonna get more in depth with that but understand I would use this on myself or my own wife it's amazing I usually average about eight weeks between the procedures again it's based on your body and how it heals if we need to push things out we do it there's no rush to do anything I tell everybody we're gonna become long-term friends but you've had this your whole life but we're going to get it taken care of a few weeks or a few extra weeks here or there is not going to change anything, but I promise you're going to get better. But, uh, the arm lift and thigh lift, we did talk about that before. I mean, like I, I stage these things out. I think it's just a better way to go and get in person. We can kind of talk about that stuff. Um, so the five liter limit guideline, um, what I'll say here is I don't really understand where the five liter limit came up from. Uh, it doesn't make sense anyway. I, again, it's kind of like my things with stages and types before. Like, I think you have to have a reason for saying something versus just five liters. So um, if somebody is younger, if somebody's younger and they've got whatever, I mean, I don't, there's not a five liter thing and I just stop. Um, other people, of course, if somebody's older or there's more issues or red skin, it'll be a little less. But what, I, what people need to understand though, and I know this is a big thing, like on the internet chat rooms is how much was taken out. And you took out, some people say, but you took out four and a half liters. You couldn't have, it's, it's not the number. I don't even look at the number, to be honest with everyone. I, I don't look at it all. I don't stop. I get everything out that we possibly can during that procedure safely. So I've had people where they've we've taken three liters out. I've had people taking eight liters out. And the reality is the number doesn't matter at all. Everybody feels better or we wouldn't do it. Um, potential complications. This is a, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but quickly, um, because we're taking out so much tissue between the skin and the muscle. And again, people with edema tissues are not internally is not good quality. Externally, 
my number one thing I worry about, or the first thing I worry about is serum, which is fluid buildup. So if somebody has a lot of volume, I'll actually put drains in. I think that's the right way to go. Um, but the blood and oxygen supply to the skin, like I said, I won't do circumferential. I think hyperbaric, I think hyperbaric um, works. And so I think that's really, really important. Um, compartment syndrome is something you hear about it. it, it I think it's really less likely. I've never actually seen this or heard of this, uh, or maybe those people had it before, but I, in my facts, I've never heard of this, but um, compartment syndrome means when your deep fascia is so tight around your muscles that the pressure inside there increases and the muscles can expand, you can get some compartment syndrome where you can get tissue death and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's scary actually. Um, Again, never seen it before. I just put it out there. So I like being pretty thorough. The, no, the thing I worry about more is the muscle perforation and puncture. Like I said, I've seen that with a few patients from other, other physicians. And I think it's a lot easier to happen with the and I think it's a little scary. So um, I'll just keep going with this. The stages, you all know, I don't believe in it <laughs> at all. Um, lipidema, can lipidema come back? The answer is yes. So, and the reason I say that is it's genetic. It's not something we can completely cure. However, what I can tell you is that I, I don't, I haven't had people where it's come back in the areas that we treated. Not saying it can't, but again, I think if you do a thorough procedure and get everything out and do it in a way that you create less, try to decrease the scarring and fibrosis that you're creating, I think the chance of it coming back is a lot, lot lower. Um, I've seen a lot of people, I do a lot of revision surgeries from inside and outside the US where people have what I call partial treatment. They've had lymphatic spring liposuction. And um, most people say they feel better for a year, 18 months, something like that. But then they say everything, the pain comes back and it's sometimes even worse. And so um, I think that's something where it just, again, shows us that I think you got to take the nodules and stuff out. But again... Uh, again, kind of, where are we, Thomas? all right, I'm going to run through this kind of quickly because again, I like to show everything, but I still have a, uh, so a bunch more things to get through. All right, just quickly, I'll just show you kind of in real time. This is a lady, older, we'll say stage three, a lot of pain. Um, I'm very, I, you know, I write everything out. I like to show everybody the different anatomical areas. Really, really important. So we put the fluid in. You can even see the, the lipidema is bulging out already. <laughs> it, just, it wants to come out. Um, again, I'll, I'll just do this in real time just to show you quickly. So I, I, I really focus. It's not with reckless abandon. It's very, very controlled and focused in the areas. But just to show everybody, this is the left side. If you, there was a previous picture, complete the left side, haven't touched the right side. So you can see the difference right now. And again, this is kind of what you can see after. Again, some people I can create a great knee for other people. It's so fibrotic there. You can't, but I, I mean, this was just a perfect real time example. Um, you can kind of see what you get out from people. And again, there's very little fluid. That's all tissue, but it, it's really, um, yeah, we document sort of everything. Um, I will skip through these because I think people know uh, before and afters are, but anyway, these are just some before and afters that we have. Um, this is when I do like a, um, uh, limb fat, like uh, the arm lift. So yeah, the left side is a lady that we just did the lymphatic sparing liposuction, did not take out any skin at all. And look at the difference there. And since she still has band-aids on, that's probably within the first couple of weeks. Um, so there's a good chance that's going to shrink up even more. But if people need an arm lift, then you go to the other side, the other slide, you can see that we do a lot of this as well too. And you can make things, but more importantly, it's if you need it. Um, thighs, again, some things shrink up for people, some nicely. This is a lady we had a really bad. We actually wound up doing a, a thigh lift, a circumferential one, because she has more tissue in the back and she actually has in the front. We probably should show the back view also. This is the hardest people to treat, but we treat a lot of that. Um, and this is someone, the skin just shrunk up really nicely. When they first came in, they probably said to me, I probably need a thigh lift because of the thigh gap. And so I don't have the thigh gap. And so again, you and I both don't know, and it's not it's more like we have to see how your body is going to react. And lipidema abdomen, I probably do uh, two to 300 or more um, uh, tummy tucks uh, or abdominoplasties a year. And so you'll see a lot of our things, but I, I love doing them. But also outside of the aesthetic thing, 
I think taking that pantus off really helps people. It helps decrease the flow, decrease the pressure on the legs and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of academic reasons for doing that as well too. Here's just a, here's kind of just another one. And I do complex ones. This is a lady. She's, I mean, I, I, if I remember her correctly, she's like less than five feet tall. <laughs> so she's, that's a lot of skin for someone. And she's had a previous, you know, gallbladder resection a long time ago. You were about healing stuff. So anyway, but I think she did okay with this. So um, all right, I'm going to kind of go through these. These we can see on websites and stuff like that. Again, this is when our patient sent us this herself. You know, everybody says, I want to wear boots. And she took a picture of her own before and after and sent it. So a little happy. But um, overall, the entire treatment goal. So we want to explain everything. We want to try to reduce pain. We want to try to improve the function. The reason to treat this, reason to treat it surgically. We want to improve mobility, the volume, uh, the body weight. Um, psychological issues we'll talk about in a little bit and discuss, but of course, expectations. So that's one thing that we're, the don't side of this is I will not promise a permanent cure for lipedema. However, I do think at this second in time, you're at what we're doing here, total lipedema care is the most advanced thing that you can, most advanced treatment you can get in the world. Um, I will not promise a cosmetic improvement. Um, it's a big question people have, oh, as I see, you know, people come in, their legs look like uh, those previous pictures, and in their mind, sometimes they picture like, you know, a, a model with legs and then they say, oh, my legs don't look like that. So I, I'm, I've just reached a point where, especially total lipidema care, we are thorough with everything, the medical check, everything that we do, including our outcomes and our pain and, and everything that we do. But I cannot tell people what their cosmetic outcome is going to be. And when people start really focusing on that, I always say sometimes that I might not actually be the right physician for you, which isn't a bad thing. Um, people do that. And they wind up, they'll wind up coming back for, for their other treatment or thorough treatment, stuff like that. But again, it, it's not, I'm very, we're very open, honest, and straightforward. And the reality is this is a medical issue. I want this to look better. Listen, it makes us happy too, but I can't control how tissues, I can't control how people heal. I can't control a lot of those things, but what I can try to control at least is what I can do to treat it and how I can make people feel better. So, um, yeah. So overall, total lipidema care, our goal is to create a center of excellence. Um, uh, center of excellence means it's not just saying that it's not us saying we're good at something that that's not what center of excellence. Center of excellence is where you're studying your outcomes. You're looking at it. You're, learning, you're, you're maturing with everything. And that's really what we're doing here. We're looking at a comprehensive approach. And a lot of people use the word comprehensive. What you're going to find here is that we're actually, um, we'll talk about research in a second, but we have a whole medical team. We're looking at a lot of other factors beforehand. We get very involved in treatment, of course, research and advocacy. We, you will hear Dr. Hurst, Dr. Deere, and myself really speaking out a lot. Um, I do think we see, we have the most advanced techniques for relieving pain and suffering. I mean, it's just, it's so much, it's so great for us to see also. So when people come in and they're happy, it makes us happy. Um, and overall, our goal is to keep improving the quality of life for those suffering with edema. You know, say it's like uh, Alexis always said, the relentless pursuit of perfection. So we're, we're striving for that. So um, this is our team. Uh, for those of you who know Dr. Herbst, she is, uh, she is our, you know, co-medical director. She's our director of research. And as you know, she is an amazing individual. She is, what I would say, the goddess of lipidema, but utilizing, having her as part, so just understand when even myself doing the surgery, like Dr. Herbst and Dr. Derry, you're, you're getting taken care of by all of us. Like the, the systems that we're putting into place, make sure that it's not just a surgeon. Dr. Herbst and Dr. Derry are so much better at the medical side of things than, than I am, I and vice versa with surgery and stuff like that. So more importantly, just understand we have director of research, we have hormones, we have nutrition, we have laboratory medicine. There's a lot going on here. Current research things. Uh, it was just, I'll keep it pretty simple right here. We've actually taken this years, but we've actually started a nonprofit organization um, that allows us to actually utilize universities for um uh, for research and actually utilizing materials, things like that. So it's really helped. It's also, you know, our goal in the future is to really utilize the, any money that's donated, you, it goes all towards research. There's, there's nothing else that, that it's used for at all. We're collaborating currently with UCLA, 
I haven't had a patient say no yet, but the, we probably every patient we send samples of fascia as well as nodules. And so it's, it's really great to see. Um, we're looking at an initial parameter. There's a lot of other stuff going on. So just understand there's a lot, 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 lot going on. Our insurance checklist, we put this together. Understand the, this is on our website. I won't even get into this right now. This is really simple that people here can help with. Just know that we really want this to work. We really want insurers to hopefully take care of this. It's not, it has nothing to do with us. It's really between your insurer, um, but it's taken us years to get a network with Aetna. We're trying all the others. It's insurance companies are a challenge. <laughs> I'll just keep it simply at that. So um, this is the, this is, uh, this is a slide that I, I really, um, I, I put in here and, and I really want people to understand it because this is, this is really, really important to us here. Um, I have daughters and I know that if my daughters started developing lipedema symptoms, uh, especially during puberty, living in California, if their ankles and legs and everything started getting larger and they were starving themselves in a very superficial society, this does lead to a lot of psychological, not, not issues, I don't want to say that, but you know, there's a lot that goes into it. A lot of people that we take care of with this do have depression and anxiety. Um, and that's not a bad thing. A lot of people in the world do. So it's not, it's not a, it's just that what happens is that a lot of people, especially nowadays, can become very introverted. They go in chat rooms. There's, they, they, they're shameful of their bodies. They think they've done something wrong. And so understand psychologically, it's very, very hard. It's the same thing when I used to, right? breast cancer, like I meet someone with breast cancer and all they say is they want their breasts out. And so, you know, understand that the, the reason I put this in here is to know that we've had patients that will take um, their anger and anxiety sort of out on us here, staff, um, you know, and we, we're very easy, we, we want to help people. So I just want people to understand there's a lot more that goes into this. I know people go to chat rooms and, and, uh, and sites and write things and this is bad and that's good. And, and it, you know, I just want people to understand that, you know, it's lipedema is really challenging to take care of and treat from a medical, societal, psychological, from every single aspect of it. Um, not a lot of people do want to take care of it because of that. We do. We actually love taking care of it. We love seeing the outcomes. I love seeing people that we met the first time I met them. They won't even look me directly in the eye, you know, they're so, and by the time, whatever it is, they graduated, they, they moved on from us. Like they're like, you can't stop them from talking. They're like new people. So it's really fun for us to see, just understand that we're trying to help and um, just know that there's a lot more that's going on sometimes inside people than just that their legs are really large. And thank you. I think that's a sort of, that's kind of the end. I hope that wasn't too long. I hope it made sense. And I hope, uh, hope I didn't miss anything. I'll try to answer as many as we, as many as we can. Um, and actually I'm going to start at the top here. So, um, would I ever consider doing the liposuction procedure while patient is awake? The, the answer, can everybody hear me? The, the answer is no. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, a, we've tried it. It, it doesn't work. Um, B, Think about how painful your legs are. There's no way I can get out or do a thorough procedure for you with you awake. People that have had it awake, just talk to them about it. A, they're usually coming back for more procedures and B, it, it's not worth it. I don't, and by the way, when people understand it's not safer, I, I know I've heard of the surgeons or, or actually people that aren't surgeons say that. So, what people have to understand is in order to numb you, in order to get enough numbing medication and you have to use with lidocaine, things like that. The reason people die after liposuction procedures is because of lidocaine toxicity. What you have to do, so again, people don't understand it's not as simple as yes or no and black or white. So if you have to use enough lidocaine or enough numbing medications to, to numb up those areas while you're awake to do this, there's no possible way you can do enough and get enough out without making it unsafe. Um, when we do this again, uh, if I, if it was my wife, this is exactly how I do it now is exactly how I would, um, how I would do it to anybody else. And so, um, 
I'm able to treat people thoroughly, get things out. They come in the next day and they can't believe the pain's gone. It's really cool to see, but no, it, it's not worth it a week for either of us. And again, I can't, I will, it's, it, I think it's torture for people when you do it awake and you can, you can hear about, I, when I do actually the hardest thing, the hardest people I take care of is my, is the revision surgeries. One, because I don't know what's happened before. I don't know if somebody's using a laser and carbon scar and I don't know what they've done, but more importantly, um, I also, when they've had awake liposuction in the U S or out, they will tell you that they have PTSD and almost don't want to do more surgery. So for me, I personally won't do it. I won't do it to my own wife. Um, I'm going to step away from lipedema and leaky gut. I think that's a better question for Dr. Herbst. Um, and so, yeah, she's, when it comes to like that type of stuff, she's really, I mean, that's why I work together. She's really, really the best. Um, uh, touch on Durkums or lymphedema Durkums. Well, I can't talk about lymphedema. So Durkums is a similar but different um, thing. You'll get a lot more, you get more angiolipomas. They can be more all over the body. Uh, there's not really much to touch on. I, I see it more in males, to be honest with you, not saying it can't be in females. Um, but I see, I see it a lot more in them. And so, and I do treat this as well too. Um, it's a, uh, yeah, uh, it's not really much to touch on. Like I said, it's more important that when you see us, like we do a full exam to make sure it's limpid lima versus Durkham's things like that. But, um, there's a lot of things, but there's not much else to touch on with it. As long as I can treat it, we try a similar process. Sometimes you can, sometimes I have to do more actually, um, just excisions for that, including larger areas. So, um, is it worth trying to break up a right tissue perfusion? Are they using grasses to break it up? Less tender, much softer, isn't that problem? So, yeah. So back to the whole fibrotic tissue. Uh, you know, there's not. Uh, I, I don't believe in the term breaking up fibrotic tissue. Um, but what I do think people are doing is by the massaging and things like that, whether I'm doing it during surgery or during or, or during it before, I think you're actually, you are opening up channels. I think you are moving things around a lot more. So I do think it's better. Um, also kind of like I was saying, like, I, like wearing, even wearing simple compression even helps out with people. So if people's feel, legs feel better, I totally think so. Just understand you can't, you're not, you can't really break up fibrotic tissue, but I think you can start to decrease the inflammatory process, kind of open things up a little bit more. And I, so I do think that is better. Um, I'm going to stay out of the compression thing. We do have a, somebody said we have a website. I, I recommend just simple things right now off Amazon. I think it's even on our website and stuff like that, because I tell people before you do surgery, don't spend a lot of money on stuff. But the reason I'm going to stay out of it right now too is, um, like I said, we're working on something, lipidine, i uh, sorry, compression is the bane of our existence uh, for the providers and for the patients. It's just hard. So we're working on some stuff, but nothing is perfect for everyone. Just understand that. So again, whatever works best for you, but um, there's before and after and a lot of other stuff. So um, somebody asked about a post-op recovery facility. Yes, I, I do that for people. We, we have a whole there's an entire process and it's all based on safety recommendations, things like that. And so just understand, I don't do surgery and send ever, not even for lipidemia for anything and send people out and say, we'll just see you in a couple of days. I, I, I'm, I'm too OCD for that. I, I want control over every little thing that I possibly can. So when before surgery, during surgery, after surgery, you, there's recovery facilities the like I said, we operate here, the same nurses that you see here are the ones that are talking all night. It's just, we want, let us, like, you have to come in with a family member, somebody, uh, an adult has to be with you, but the reality is we want to take care of you. We're going to do all that. We, I, I don't, I don't trust anybody else. And so, um, do I need to be diagnosed prior to consult with TLC? No, you, you, you don't need to be diagnosed prior to consult with TLC. So the reality is, um, I, I, there's not many people that do and not many people that I think really even understand the overall process with it. So no, you don't have to, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. But no, our, our goal here is to help as many people as possible. So um, if you already had liposuction and it's come back with a vengeance, is another liposuction going to help? Yeah. So that you're, you literally hit the nail on the head for exactly what I was mentioning earlier. So I'm glad this actually, <laughs> I'm glad this question's out there. So again, um, 
The answer is yes, I do this. But again, don't focus on another liposuction. Focus on the techniques that we're doing here, uh, including the manual technique. And so, yes. And I even have patients you can speak with that I've taken care of from uh, Europe, from in the US. I, I, and so they can tell you they've gone through the exact same thing you have. So the answer is it, if I didn't, if I wasn't making it better, I would tell you. Um, but we, we really are seeing it. So, um, Uh, someone's asking about massage guns. They can break up the nodules. I, you can't break up. Uh, listen, okay. Again, breaking up the fibrosis and the nodules, you see me squeezing them with my hands <laughs> like during a surgery. If you think you can externally break it up, I be my get. I, I just, and besides, if you do, it's already a hard fibrotic nodule. You can't break it up. You have to remove it. it, it it's like, even lipomas, by the way, even lipomas that are not lipedema, like regular just lipomas, you can't break it up. You have to cut it out because you have to take up the sac and the capsule and everything. Otherwise, they keep coming back. So anyway, um, again, I like massage guns, though. I do think, again, anything you can help to decrease inflammation. Also, it probably does help with decreasing sensitivity, they desensitize the area. So I, I'm totally, totally. Um, Why well, be sharing manual type with other providers? Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, I, the, the, the problem you're seeing with this is, um, I actually, I don't know. It's, it's out there. We're actually, we're, we're going to publish some papers on it and stuff like that. And so, um, I, I can't, I can't tell other doctors what to do and how to do things. You know, our goal is to expand what we do with total lipidemic care, but I, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to help in any way. Um, when you remove the fiber tissue, does that reduce the long-term swelling? So the ankle, I'm saying, I guess that means cuff, ankle, calves, and knees be better after this process. Yeah, I mean, you can look at all, I mean, before and after photos, you can talk to our patients. So yes, by removing the tissue, my goal is to remove as much as I can between the skin and the muscle, we'll say, so things shrink up. So the answer is yes. I mean, uh, um, yeah. Um, Okay, I'll answer this last question. Is there any difference in the treatment of lipolipidema or any greater risks? Okay, so that's actually a pretty good question. Um, my tr when I say my treatment is the same, it doesn't mean it's the same as every single person. It means I'm still going to do my techniques. There's probably slightly different ways I might do it. I do treat a lot of lipo um, lymph. I'm assuming you're lymphedema. But I'm, do you treat a lot of lipo lymphedema as well too? And we still see very similar outcomes and everything. Um, are there greater risks? I think there, um, the answer is probably yes, because you already have lymphedema. And that's one of the scary things when I think people use um, uh, like energy-based device like Vaser or just create more scarring inside. I think you have a higher, ch you know, can, you, you don't want to create lymphedema, but so I think there are, but I, I haven't seen any more issues with it, the way we treat it. Because like I said, it's actually a gentle process. Um, I think it's more of a challenge to treat, um, but there's good and there's bad. There's some people that already are so in tune with the compression and everything. And so it makes it even easier. So it's, it, it, it's back and forth there. But anyway, um, I think that's it for today. So um, anything, you know, listen, thank you so much for taking the time and, and being here with us. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Anything we could ever do, just let us know. Um, we're going to keep doing this, keep putting things out there. And like I said, we, we just, we, we, we love the opportunity to take care of people and love to see when, love to see everyone get better. So anyway, thank you so much for your time today. Have a great rest of the weekend. Um, have a great new year. And of course, with everything going on in the world, please be safe. Um, we look forward to speaking with you soon and talking to you. Take care.